Welcome to Kate's Garden. Today I am going to be talking about the varieties that I am growing in my garden this year. And I actually did a list about three years ago talking about the specific varieties that I like to grow in my Zone 5 garden. This is going to be an updated list because since then I've changed out a lot of the varieties that I grow. And that video is really popular so I think you guys will enjoy this. Um, I'm not going to be including the things that my kids are growing in their gardens or flowers or herbs in this list because I already have five pages of vegetables so this video would just be way too long and honestly with flowers and herbs it's more your preference I mean flowers it's what you like to look at and herbs it's mostly what you like for flavor not so much um, what does well in a specific zone so I'm just going to be covering vegetables and I probably will skip over um, some that I am just trialing a couple plants of. So this will be the main varieties that I'm growing in my garden. Um, and one thing that I want to talk about before I start is that this is titled Zone 5 Garden List, just because that's a reference point for people. Your zone has to do with how cold you get in the winter, which doesn't so much impact the annual vegetable varieties that you're growing but it does give you an idea of what that season is going to be like. So this could also be called a short season garden list. Um, I live in Montana and we get anywhere from 80 to 120 days between frosts in the summer. So it's a pretty short season. Um, I would say our average is like 90, 95 days. The last two years it has been longer and we've gotten more like 110 to 120. So that has been fantastic. But anyway, I'm going to dive into these varieties, starting with tomatoes. Um, so for tomatoes, I'm growing San Marzano, which is a paste tomato. I have three paste tomatoes that I am growing in my garden this year. San Marzano, I have been growing for probably 12 years, and it has been my favorite for a long, long time. It would never get blossom end rot even when my other varieties did. Well, about three years ago, San Marzano started getting blossom end rot. Uh, really badly, even though I was adding calcium at planting time, um, the San Marzanos would just, they would start to turn to red when they were only maybe a third of the size they were supposed to be, and then they would start to rot on the plant. So I think that it was some kind of virus. I did contact my local extension office and we couldn't really get any answers. But long story short, um, I have been selecting the last few years the San Marzano tomatoes that did not get blossom end rot and saving seeds from those. So it is an improved variety of San Marzano tomato that I will be growing. Um, and that's something else that I should note. A lot of these varieties I'm growing, I've had these seeds for years and years. And so I've been saving them and they are more adapted to my local climate maybe than when I started. So that is one tip that, um, that you might find helpful, especially if you're in a short season climate just if you can get enough of a variety to do well that you can save seeds from it then you can keep improving it and selecting the faster growing plants from that variety each year all right so hungarian heart is another paste tomato um, this one came from baker creek and i really liked it these can get over a pound a lot of them get over a pound they're a really nice meaty sauce tomato um, and the third sauce tomato I'm going to be growing is Porter. Those are really small, teeny tiny, um, not a lot bigger than a cherry tomato, maybe one ounce. And they're still, they're a really good paste tomato. They're drought tolerant and I don't get a lot of water where I live. We don't get much rain and I don't have a very good well. So that has been uh, really helpful growing varieties that are more drought tolerant for me. And then it's also a short season variety. So for uh, slicing tomatoes. We grow a lot of striped brandywine. That's a variety that we developed here by crossing brandywine tomatoes with a striped tomato. It's really fast growing and it produces better than black brandywine. But I still like to grow some black brandywines too. Those are just so pretty. So I'll grow a few of these as well. And then Costaluto Genovese. That's an Italian. It can be a slicing tomato or a paste tomato. These are really good and really pretty. And I will grow a few each of Black Beauty, Great White, Golden King of Siberia, and Kellogg's Breakfast. 
and probably a few others. Uh, for cherry tomatoes, my favorite has been Gardener's Delight, which is just a red cherry tomato. It is open pollinated. Um, and it's the most productive of all the cherry tomatoes that I've tried that are open pollinated. Violet Jasper is a, I would call it a salad tomato. They are one ounce. Um, they are striped, kind of a dark, darker red with faint green striping on them. So they're really pretty. And those were also really popular when I did a market garden. So they're kind of in between, well, a little bit bigger than a cherry tomato. <clears throat> all right, moving on to peppers. Um, I'm just going to cover my favorites here because there are a lot of pepper varieties that I grow. Peppers are very hard in a short season. And also since our nights are so cool here, it's hard to get much of a crop. All of these varieties I'm going to mention, you can grow straight out in the garden in zone five or in a short season. But I found that if I grow them in a high tunnel, just um, you know, a makeshift greenhouse that doesn't even have heat, I can double or triple my production from all of these. So the first one is King of the North. This is just a standard red bell pepper that is early season. It's open pollinated. It does really, really well in my area. So probably half the peppers I plant are this single variety. And these did come from Baker Creek, but this variety is available in quite a few places. A lot of catalogs carry it. Um, next is going to be a mini bell pepper mix. These are really great, especially if you're growing straight out in the garden in a short season climate. They're really prolific and they're just tiny little bell peppers. Um, I think that the Seed Savers Exchange carries these and then I got mine from Baker Creek. So I've been growing these for, I don't know, five years or more. Um, next is the Natapinos and Habanados. So these are heatless hot peppers. We love the Natapinos. We grow a lot of these. Um, actually, I should have pulled some out of the freezer to show you because I still have some frozen whole ones. These are huge. Actually, ours get a lot bigger than they look in this picture. And they have really good jalapeno flavor without the heat, which I love. I like just a little bit of heat. I can't do anything that's super spicy. And the habaneros is the same thing. It's a heatless habanero. Let's see. So then I'm going to be growing cayenne peppers, which I grind up for cayenne powder and Sugar Rush Peach. These are amazing in salsa. And Bulgarian Carrot is another of my favorites. It is very, very hot, but it does well in my area. It's great for hot sauce or if you just want to add a tiny bit of spice to something. Uh, for tomatillos, my favorite is Queen of Melanalco, which I got from Baker Creek. They don't carry that exact variety anymore. They have one that's similar, but it's a large yellow tomatillo um, it's really sweet. It's not quite your typical tomatillo flavor, but we use ours for salsa verde and also just like for fresh eating. I'll throw some into a regular fresh salsa or whatever recipe I'm making. Um, so then garden berries. We love the garden berries. Um, we grow chichi colite berries. These are, uh, when they're cooked, they taste similar to a blueberry. So they're really good in pies. They're also really sweet if you just snack on them. So this is an annual berry that you grow like a tomato. Um, they are, I mean, unlike a normal berry that you might have to wait a few years to harvest, these are annual, so you can put them in and a couple months later you have fruit. So that's one reason that we really like these. Another one is the orange berry. So this is more of an orange-like flavor, but the same kind of thing. These are in the tomato family. And then uh, the third garden berry that we grow is the lychee berry, which is red. It's pretty good size, kind of a cherry-like flavor. The lychee berries are a little bit harder to harvest because they have spines all over them. So that's something that I can grow outside of my garden and the deer don't bother them, but they are a pain when it comes to harvesting. It's just really hard to get around the spines and not get poked. All right, so for potatoes, our favorite is the Huckleberry Gold, which is a low glycemic index potato. It is purple on the outside, gold on the inside. I should have grabbed some of these when I was down in the root cellar and I forgot. But the Huckleberry Gold potato is really pretty and it tastes amazing. 
and they were developed here in Montana, I believe. So they just, they do really well in the short season. Um, I also grow just your Yukon Gold, Red, and Russet. And really most potatoes do well in our climate. You don't have to be too picky about varieties. So moving on to squash. Um, my favorite zucchini is the Costata Romanesco. And I have a huge one here because this one was hand pollinated for seed and I haven't taken the seeds out of it. So normally I would harvest this at about half the size for eating. They can get quite a bit bigger than your standard black zucchini and they still taste good. They really, um, at any size, they have a milder flavor than a black zucchini. And these are lighter, they're kind of a light green in color when they first come off the plant. This one's oranged a bit since it's been in storage for a few months. And these are really prolific. I usually get a higher yield from them. They are a little, uh, a little slower to set fruit than the standard black zucchini. So I grow both, but most of the black zucchinis go to the livestock. And these are the ones that come in my kitchen because I prefer to cook with these. And then I grow saffron, which is just a plain yellow squash. Um, and then Bedding's Green Tint, which is a patty ham squash. Um, moving on to winter squash, my favorite is Oregon Homestead Sweet Meat. Oregon Homestead is an improved variety of sweet meat. I do have a little guy up here. Most of them are two to three times this size. Uh, 10 pounds is a pretty common weight for these. They are really dense. They have a small seed cavity, so most of this is meat. I mean, this guy is tiny and it's three pounds. These have really good flavor and they're really prolific even when we have a shorter season. So I do probably half of my winter squash is this one variety. Um, we also do Cinderella pumpkin. The specific variety I like to get is Rouge, which comes from Baker Creek. And those are also really prolific and reliable in our area. I've had some of them get to over 40 pounds, which is rare for any kind of squash. I mean, I've grown some of the larger, like Big Macs, that's supposed to get to 100 pounds, and it doesn't get anywhere near that. The Cinderella pumpkins usually are the largest pumpkins that I get in my garden. Uh, I'm growing Winter Luxury, which is not as prolific as the first two squash that I mentioned, but I really love the flavor of the Winter Luxury. It just makes amazing creamy pies. Um, and then the Lady Godiva. This one is really prolific in our area. And this is a naked seeded pumpkin, or holeless pumpkin, it would be called. So you can see these green seeds don't have any hole on them. So they are wonderful for roasting or making into pumpkin flour. Um, you could also press them for oil. The flesh on these is not, it's more stringy, kind of like a spaghetti squash. So I have used it like spaghetti squash. A lot of times I just take the green seeds out of these for the kitchen and I give the meat to the animals because we don't like it as much as the other varieties we grow. And then I always plant a lot of different winter squash. So I'll do a few Gerardale um, Early Mountaineer, which is a, um, it would be a no irrigation type of squash. Um, and then Red Curry, Bitterroot Buttercup, I am not sure if I'll grow Sibley or Hubbard this year because I just, I like the sweet meat so much more because these are so dense. It's kind of a similar thing, but the Sibley and Hubbard, you don't get nearly as much squash from the same size squash, if that makes sense. And then there are some other varieties that aren't as reliable in my climate, but I really like them. So I usually, I'll probably plant maybe two plants of each. So those would be the Amish pie squash which can get to 40 pounds or more. Um, pink banana, Geteoko somen, Burpees butterbush, which is a butternut squash. And that's the best butternut squash that I've found. For my climate, it is pretty hard to get butternut squash to set fruit in our area. All right, so for cucumbers, I like lemon cucumbers. So we'll be growing some of those. I also have these Tokyo greens. These are, they're later to set fruit and not real prolific in my area, but we really like the flavor. They're just a wonderful salad cucumber. 
So I do grow some of these every year. And then I have some pickles here. These are the pickling cucumbers that I grow. This is actually a mix. I could not find a pickling cucumber that I really liked. So I took eight heirloom cucumbers. I let them all cross together. And the last few years I've been selecting out the ones that I like, the plants that I like. I hand pollinate or I uh, save seeds from those before my other varieties are in bloom to make sure they don't cross. And so I just call this bitterroot pickling cucumber because I developed this in my garden. And you know, that's something that anybody can do in their garden to adapt a variety to your climate if you can't find something that you like. I don't even remember the varieties that were in this. Um, I used to grow market more. That had been the best one that I'd found for my area. National pickling cucumber did not do well at all for me. And I don't think I used national when I developed this but it did have market more in it as one of the eight heirlooms that were in here. <clears throat> All right, so next I have melons. I have tried dozens of melons. Um, it's really hard to get melons to ripen in my climate. A lot of times they just don't ever sweeten up. And sometimes that just, it depends on the year. Some years they don't really sweeten. This year I am going to be growing them in the high tunnel to give them a little better chance. Um, mostly when you're looking for a melon, you're just gonna wanna look for the shortest season. So for watermelon, Blacktail Mountain is the most reliable that I have tried. And it was developed in Idaho, so kind of close to me. And it's just your standard seeded red watermelon um, for Regular melons, let's see, I grow the Listola, Hale's Best Jumbo. Sometimes I get a good crop out of these. Um, let's see, these are some new ones that I'm trying from Baker Creek. I've got your standard Charentes melons. These are pretty short season. Um, Crane is another new one that I'm trying from Baker Creek. Bidwell Cassaba. Um, Prescott Fond Blanc. One melon that I think I had mentioned in a previous video was the Jenny Lind muskmelon. Those are a miniature muskmelon. They do ripen really well in our climate, but I've stopped growing those because the wasps get to them. For some reason they crack open and the wasps get them as soon as they're ripe before they even slip off the plant. And so I, I could hardly ever get a good one in the kitchen. So I'm going to be skipping that even though it does do well here. For carrots, there are two hybrids that I grow. Um, these are the only hybrids that I grow in my garden. And I started growing hybrid carrots because I was, um, I was selling produce and I needed something that was sweet in the summertime. A lot of the heirlooms were just not very good flavored in the summertime and they took so long to mature that they took a lot of space in the garden and I needed something that was ready earlier. So the two hybrid carrots that I grow are mochum and napoli. Mochum I plant in the spring through the summer. It's a super, super fast hybrid carrot. They're really sweet even in the middle of summer. And then napoli I plant mid to late summer for a fall harvest because they get super sweet and crunchy once the frost hits them. Um, this, this might be the last year that I grow these two. I am going to keep growing them because I have seeds for them, but I actually found an open pollinated carrot I like that is replacing those two. And that is New Corota. Uh, I think I have one here. New Corota. This is one I just pulled out of storage. Um, these are from Baker Creek and they're an open pollinated carrot that is super sweet and they're really fast growing. So I think they're comparable to the hybrids. And as I run out of the hybrid seeds, I probably won't replace them. I will just grow more of these since I can save the seeds from these myself. And then I will grow um, a few ox heart carrots. Those are really big orange carrots. Um, some Nif, Black Nebula, and Yellowstone just for the different colors. Those will be grown for fall storage carrots because they're not as sweet if they're grown in the summer. And then we always grow a lot of cosmic purple. That's my kid's favorite carrot. They're purple on the outside and orange on the inside. They're pretty fast for a carrot and they're just, they're good all season. 
they're good in the summer and then they sweeten up in the fall and they store pretty well. Okay, so for beets, um, Solyndra is my favorite beet. It just has amazing buttery flavor. It's kind of long and skinny. Uh, I actually didn't, well, we ate all that we grew last year, so I don't have one on hand to show you. But Solyndra is my personal favorite. For a market garden, my favorite is Early Wonder Tall Top, which is just your standard red beet. It is open pollinated and fast growing. <clears throat> Um, for turnips, white egg is the best that I've found. I think I have one here. This is a white egg turnip. These are the best I've found for my area. Uh, they get a lot bigger than that if they have the time to grow. And they're pretty prolific. Um, and I also grow one of the red ones from Baker Creek. Uh, for parsnips, Harris Model has been my favorite. For probably 12 years I've been saving seeds from it. For radishes, the 18 Jewers is my favorite single variety, and it's kind of your standard red and white, but it's a little longer and skinnier, not plain round, and it's really fast growing. Um, the name is 18 because it can be grown in 18 days if the conditions are optimal. I also have an heirloom mix of spring radishes. It started with, um, it was an heirloom mix that Baker Creek offered of all their spring radishes. So it had like 15 varieties. And I've let those cross with each other and save seeds from them for years. So it's really mixed now. I think originally they took seeds from the individual varieties and mixed them into one, um, one envelope of seeds, but they weren't, the, the different varieties weren't mixed together like they are now in my garden. And then I also grow Chinese red meat, which is a winter storage radish. This one came from Baker Creek. Um, I'm showing you a lot of the Baker Creek packets just because those have the pretty pictures on them. I also get a lot of seeds from Fedco, uh, some from Azure Standard, um, Seed Savers Exchange, Botanical Interests. Um, and I have some that I just, you know, picked up from here and there, wherever. For onions, I prefer red onions, so that is what I grow. I grow two kinds of red onions. Uh, the first is Red Weathersfield. These are super sweet. They A lot of times they get half a pound. This is actually a smaller one. A lot of them are double this size. These are just amazing. <laughs> they were really popular when I did Market Garden. And, you know, my kids don't really like onions, but these are sweeter and a lot easier to get in them. Uh, these aren't the greatest for storage, so we harvest these throughout the summer when they're fresh. Uh, we eat them through the fall. And I do, I still have a box downstairs that are still good. I usually pull them out as they sprout and use those first, because when they just have a short sprout, they're still completely edible. And they usually haven't rotted or anything at that stage. So I use them up as they sprout and I'll still have a few left going into spring. When these are all sprouted, then I switch to oops, my other red variety, which is Red Weathersfield. And that is a standard round red onion, but it stores a lot better. So we'll eat that from late spring until the Red of Florence are ready to harvest. So for leeks, I grow King Siege. Uh, that's been my favorite for several years, and I've grown quite a few leeks, but King Siege is just the most reliable for me, and I companion plant that with celery. I have switched celery varieties. Now I mainly just grow Tango, which is a green celery. I got the seeds from Fedco. It is open pollinated. It's really fast, just your standard green celery. Um, I like Red Venture. That was my favorite celery for years, but the tanko is just more tender. So I had switched to it because I was market gardening and this was more marketable than the red celeries. Uh, moving on to the brassicas. For cabbage, I grow two main varieties. Uh, Golden Acre is a really good summer variety. It's open pollinated, but it's really fast and really consistent. It's just your standard green cabbage. And then for storage, I grow late flat Dutch. 
these can get like 10 or 15 pounds or more. This is a smaller one. Um, actually, my sheep got in these this year and ate most of them, so we didn't get nearly as many as I was planning, and the sheep ate a lot of the big ones. But this is Lake Flat Dutch. Um, so we plant these about June, and then we harvest these in the fall and keep them for our winter storage cabbage. And one that I tried for the first time last year was Sephora Giant Cabbage from Baker Creek. Last year the sheep got them, so this year I will be trying some of those again. Those supposedly can get to 40 pounds or more. Uh, for cauliflower, Snowball is still my favorite. That's an open pollinated white cauliflower. Uh, for broccoli, DeSisso has been my favorite for quite a few years. It's just pretty consistent and reliable for me. And then I also like Purple Peacock, which is a broccoli kale hybrid that's kind of a green purple color. Um, it would also be considered a broccolini. And the seeds for that are a little bit hard to find, but if you can find them, I would definitely recommend trying Purple Peacock. Um, lettuce, really any variety of lettuce does well in my climate. You don't have to be too picky. It's whatever you like. I grow a lot of crisp mint, which is a standard green romaine that does well in the summer. I like four lunch lots, which is a speckled heirloom romaine um, that does well in the summer too. I have the winter and summer lettuce mixes from Bedco. Those are amazing. Um, so the one, the winter one would be more cold hardy. The summer one is more heat tolerant. So I switched those depending on the season and those I've been saving seeds from for years. Um, I also like the ghoulies favorite, Butterhead. Ooh, if I can get the seed packet here. So that's from the Seed Savers Exchange. It is just a really yummy, crunchy, buttery, mild flavored lettuce. And this one does do well in the summer heat. Um, granted, we don't get real hot here in Montana, but still some varieties do better than others. Um, and Winter Density is another of my favorites. That's a little darker green and the leaves are thicker than a lot of romaines that you find. So it's also a little more cold tolerant. Um, for spinach, my favorite is Giant Winter. I've tried quite a few spinaches and that one I just get the biggest yields from before it bolts. And then it's also pretty cold hardy as well. So I'll usually do a spring crop of that and then plant it again late summer for more of a fall crop. Uh, for kale, my favorite is Wild Garden Kale Mix, which I don't know if you can still find seeds for it. It is a Siberian kale, which is a different species than the common European kales. And I found that the Sib Siberian kales just do a lot better in my climate. I can even harvest them through the winter if I want to. So, I mean, that's a tip if you just look for a Siberian kale. It's going to do a lot better in a colder climate. Um, sorrel is a perennial salad green. It's lemony flavor and just really yummy and it comes back year after year here in zone five. So I have just the common green sorrel and then this year I'm planting bloody dock which is a different color of sorrel. I'm going to try incorporating this one into uh, my flower beds that are around the house just because it's prettier. Um, I have heard that this one is stronger flavored though so if you're just going for flavor you might want to stick with the solid light green sorrel. All right, so for beans, my favorite bush bean is green crop, which just keeps going and going and going, which is something I hadn't really found in a bush bean. A lot of times they would produce for a week or two and then be done. But green crop, a lot of times I can keep it going all summer long, which is really rare for a bush bean. Um, that one I grew a lot of for a market garden. For pool beans, I have a mix. I just let them all mix together. I save seeds from all of them together. Um, sometimes they cross with each other, but mostly my varieties do stay distinct, even grown side by side. So that pool bean mix originally came from Fedco. It was just their pool bean mix. Um, since then, I have added other pool beans to it. So I don't even know how many varieties are in it. I know that it has Kentucky Wonder, uh, Rattlesnake, Gold Marie, Vortex, Purple Potted Pull Bean. Um, it has an heirloom pull bean that my friend gave me that's adapted to my area. It also has Marble, Marvel of Venice. 
which is a really pretty yellow wax bean. And then for dry beans, I'm not trying anything new this year, but I am growing some of the same varieties I've been growing. This is Arakara Yellow. So this one is a really good baked bean. Um, all of the dry beans that I grow, I selected varieties that are uh, that have a really short um, base to maturity. So they do better in my climate. Uh, this is Calypso. This one is really good for soups. It's pretty, pretty uh, black and white. Uh, oh, this is Tiger's Eye. These are kind of like a pinto bean. That's how I use them. They are really, really good for refried beans. Uh, those three, I got all those from Seaver, Seed Savers Exchange. And then this is Jacob's Cattle. I've had this one for years. Super pretty maroon and white speckled. And these are good for soup. All right, so for peas, I like their standard sugar snap or super sugar snap. Um, pretty much any pea variety is going to do well here. Uh, for a sugar pea or snow pea, I like Caribbean de Maison from Baker Creek or Mammoth Melting Snow, which I think I originally got from Fedco, and I don't know whether they are still selling it. Uh, for corn, corn can be challenging in our area. You really want to look for something that has a shorter days to maturity. I look for something that has like 80 days or less. And I like to grow open pollinated corns. So my sweet corns are Orchard Baby, which came from Baker Creek, and then Double Standard, which came from Azure Standard. Um, this year, so I switched back and forth between growing popcorn and flower corn, because I just don't really have space to grow both. So this year I'm going to be growing the Dakota Black Popcorn, which I should have grabbed some seeds. I didn't bring some in here, they're in the other room. Uh, but Dakota Black Popcorn is the only popcorn I've gotten to mature in my climate. And it's, it's smaller, like when you pop the seeds, they're smaller than your standard yellow popcorn. But they have really good flavor and crunch, and they're just, they're yummy. Um, and then I do have Painted Mountain Flower Corn here. This is the most reliable flower corn for a short season or um, if you don't have good irrigation. I usually pick out individual colors of seeds. Like this year, I mostly planted white seeds. Um, we like the flavor of the flower better if we separate out, like we grow all red seeds or all white seeds or whatever. Or if you just separate like the, the ears, the different colors of ears, um, before you shell them. So we do like 20 pounds of this every year and it's yummy. All right, so I said I wasn't going to talk about herbs. There is one herb that I want to cover. That is basil. Um, basil can be a little challenging because our nights are so cool here and it likes heat. The best one that I have found is the uh, lettuce leaf, lettuce leaf, which I got from Baker Creek. And it's just really prolific. It has your standard basil flavor. Usually I grow some different ones besides that, but those are more of whatever flavor I like. The main basil that I am growing and preserving is the lettuce leaf. So that is my list. Um, I've really been trying to nail down varieties that are really reliable in my climate that I can depend on to feed my family. So that's kind of the main criteria for picking these varieties that do well reliably in a short season. Um, I also want to grow things that store or otherwise are able to preserve well uh, so that we can have them year-round and don't have to go to the grocery store. I like crops that have good flavor um, and I also like some things that are just unique like all of my different colors of carrots and tomatoes that they're just fun and unique. So yeah that is um, those are the main crops that I'm going to be growing in my zone five garden this year. If you live in a cold climate and there are some varieties that you really love for a short season or cold climate, then please share them in the comments. Do you enjoy the challenge of gardening? So do I. 
That's why I began saving seeds from my garden more than 10 years ago. Saving seeds was a lot of fun, but I quickly discovered how much I didn't know, like how my pumpkins turned into pumpkinzinis and sweet peppers turned hot. Since I first started, I've learned from other seed savers, read just about every seed saving book out there, and each year put it all into practice in my own garden. I've combined everything I've learned into an easy online course that simplifies seed saving for beginners. With Simple Seed Saving, you can begin successfully saving seeds from your garden today. Simple Seed Saving gives you all the info you need to prevent unwanted crossing, save pure seeds from all of your plants to grow next year. The course includes handy reference charts, printable seed packets, and access to a private Facebook group where you can ask questions anytime. Saving seeds is a great way to save money, preserve your favorite seed varieties, and become less dependent on the grocery store. Start saving seeds today.